Hello again, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's Sight and Sound Bites webinar. Uh, as you have know, if you've attended these before, I'm Carrie Fogel, uh, the Senior Director of Development for the Ioneer Foundation. And we do these Sight and Sound Bites webinars every month and featuring different topics related to vision loss, hearing loss, head and neck cancer, sinus allergy, and balance disorders and conditions of the voice. So today's topic represents um, some really unique research programs here at the University of Pittsburgh and the Vision Institute at UPMC Mercy. Um, and we're gonna focus on discussing the street lab and improving functional outcomes in low vision rehabilitation. Our speakers today are Dr. Rocky Acham and Dr. Clive D'Souza with a special introduction by our chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel. Um, as a reminder, uh, we won't use the chat function um, in today's Zoom webinar. We'll be using the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. So if at any point during the presentation you have a question for one of the presenters, please submit it to the Q&A box at, at any point, and we will make sure to ask uh, the question during the um, question and answer uh, section at the end of the program. Um, time permitting, I will get to all of them. If not, uh, and we may um, have to take the questions and then send them directly to our speakers, and we'll get back to you via email uh, following today's discussion. There will also be a video recording of today's presentation available on the IONEER Foundation website. So I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Rocky Acham. Dr. Chom is an associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh. She obtained her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh and served as the president of the American Society of Biomechanics. She's interested in human and environmental factors that impact balance and gait with the long-term goal of minimi minimizing falls risks and improving mobility and quality of life. The populations of her research interests include older adults, workers, and more recently, adults with vision-related conditions. And our co-presenter today is Dr. Clive D'Souza. Dr. D'Souza is an assistant professor of research and researcher in the Department of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. His academic training is in human factors engineering, which is a scientific discipline concerned with the design and evaluation of products, technologies, and systems to make them compatible with the needs, abilities, and limitations of people. Dr. D'Souza's research focuses on accessible transportation in which he engages people with disabilities, young and old, in studies investigating the environmental and technological barriers to transportation that prevent them from safely and independently traveling in their communities. At the UPMC Vision Institute and as part of the Street Lab, which he works on with Dr. Chom, he conducts research related to low vision and driving, including on new technologies and measures to evaluate, improve, and maintain driving capacity in individuals with low vision. So before we get started with the program, I'd like to introduce our chairman, Dr. Sahel, to kind of give a background on this topic and what we'll be talking about today. Dr. Sahel? Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome to this webinar. So I, I won't be long. I just want to give a background why we are doing all of that. Uh, this is based on the fact that uh, in uh, ophthalmology, we tend to be uh, focused on the therapies and the way to fix the rate of ocular conditions and visual conditions. And the way we do the assessment is based most of the time on the classical testing, like visual equity, visual field. But it turns out that this may not reflect fully what happens in daily life for our patients. And when we want to make an assessment and better understand the challenges they are facing, it's important to develop the methods and the approaches that enable the proper evaluation of what is happening and reflect actually what patients are telling us. This is also very important to demonstrate the benefit of a therapy in daily life. And the therapy can be obviously a surgery, can be a drug, can be many ways, but it's also the rehabilitation process and the, all the technologies that are currently in development already in the clinic to restore vision to our patients. So this is part of a continuum of care where we try to really help our patient from the diagnosis to coming back to 
uh, a life uh, a way they enjoy to live. And this uh, means that we have to develop all the tools and all of these are patient centered. So I was very privileged when I moved from Paris to Pittsburgh to meet with uh, Rakia Sham uh, years ago already and to start to collaborate on uh, these approaches. And uh, we were fortunate to recruit uh, Clive de Souza from Michigan to join us uh, together with the Department of Rehabilitation and uh, really they have joint appointment with us and other departments to really work together. And uh, this is part actually of a much larger endeavor around patient-centered approach to rehabilitation. So I'm very happy to hand over to Rakia, who is going to be the first speaker, and I'll stay available at the end if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you both for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. So our mission um, at the Street Lab um, is to very simple is to enhance the quality of life of people with low vision. So when I say quality of life, um, I'm going to give you a little bit more specific examples here. Um, improve the function of people with low vision. So this is very patient centric. Um, improving something uh, function for one person may be different of um, improving function for another person, depending on their interests, on their needs. Um, so it's again very. Um, very patient-centric. We want to promote independence, uh, attempt to have them do things on their own as long as possible, whether it's at home, at work, in the community, and then uh, promote productivity in society. So as many of you know, people with low vision are not just, <clears throat> are not represented well in the workforce, um, not just unemployed, but also when they do find work, they're often not in the right jobs, so underemployed as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so who are we? Um, many people. It's a very multidisciplinary um, team that we have. Um, Dr. D'Souza and myself are presenting, but please remember that there's a lot of people uh, behind us um, who are, we're collaborating with to make this happen. So obviously, um, clinician and low vision um, specialists, like of the ophthalmologist and ophthalmetrist, uh, biomedical engineer. So I have a background in biomedical engineer. We work with many um, rehabilitation experts, like uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists. Um, I work with psychiatrists because often people who um, do have vision problem have also higher increased um risk for mental health problem like depression, anxiety. Um, I work with neurologists and vestibular um, experts because of balance issues. Neuroscientists were interested in what's happening in the brain because there's a lot of adaptation, both structural and functional in the brain to adapt to low vision. Um, psychologists and people like Dr. D'Souza, um, the human factors experts. <clears throat> Where are we? Where we're in the Vision Institute on the fifth floor. Um, it's a state-of-the-art building um, and state-of-the-art technology. So I hope you, if you ever have uh, interest in touring, just send us a note here. And what are we? Um, this will come become clear in the next few slides. So we talked about our vision. Now let's talk about our, our mission. And now I want to talk a little bit about our um, vision uh, for the research program. It's organized in three thrusts. We always start with the individual. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's very, um, what we do is very patient-centric. So we want to understand the needs, um, the individual perceptions of their impairment. So not so much their visual acuity as a number, but how do they perceive their impairment? So they may tell you, oh, I'm not able to knit as well, or I'm not able to watch TV as well. So again, how do they perceive um, their, their impairment? And obviously in that first thrust, we also focus on the impaired, um, on the impairment um, assessed objectively, like the visual field loss, the visual field, uh, the visual acuity deficits. Um, and just remember that just because low vision is, is happening, there is a lot of other things that may interact with it. So for example, uh, vision, loss of vision is a big deal uh, for balance and mobility. People with balance, with vision problems are at an increased risk of fault and, and balance. And so again, we take this holistic approach of understanding 
um, the patient as, as a whole and what they need and what they want us to help them with. And then this information is, feed, is fed into the activities and participation assessment. So I will be, this talk will be um, focused a lot on performance-based assessments or activities, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so we have, again, um, assessments that um, evaluate how people are maintaining balance, how they're able to walk, going from point A to point P, how are they performing fine motor tasks, which are important, again, for daily activities, like buttoning a shirt or being able to cook something in the kitchen um, or at work in manufacturing jobs. So th these are very objective-based assessments, based um, performance-based assessments. And then, obviously, um, we have been funded by NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Health, um, Safety and Health, and they're interested in increasing participation in uh, people with low vision at work. Um, so this is another, again, under activities and participation. And then as Dr. Sahel mentioned earlier, um, there is a lot of um, treatments, very exciting treatments for people with low vision, um, but we are missing how to assess and how to evaluate um, those treatments, kind of where the engineering, my background in engineering comes in, uh, measurements and assessments. So we want to be able to come up with, develop ways of very precisely and objectively uh, be able to assess um, all those, all those uh, new treatments. Um, and so we might follow people, you know, along their disease, their natural, the natural progression of their disease, or look at the impact of whether it's a gene therapy, whether it's a surgery, whether it's a therapy, um, or the or providing someone with an assistive technology. So these are the three three thrusts, research thrusts that we have in. And again, we're going to focus on um, activities here, just for um, time constraint, and just to make sure you don't sleep on me and you're awake. I'm going to do this in. Um, in, in uh, not in order here. So I'm going to talk first of all about some of the assessment that we're using for um, to evaluate fine motor tasks, and then we'll talk about mobility balance, and then finally Dr. D'Souza will take it uh, and talk about um, driving and uh, transportation. All right, let's talk about fine motor tasks for a second. Just need to make sure I'm on time here. So why fine motor task? And I kind of talked about this a little bit already, right? The, the relevance of this is, first of all, in tasks that you do at home, we, I gave you the example of buttoning a shirt, of writing, of um, being able to cook and use the stove, uh, but also at work. So a lot of manufacturing jobs rely on vision. And um, one of the problems of um, employers is that they do not understand what people with low vision are able to do. So NIOSH has funded us to come up with metrics that basically provide this information. So based on someone's visual acuity or visual field loss, what are they able to do at job at, on the job? And this information can be used to put people in the right jobs. Um, and so this is where, again, the human factors comes in, right? If you can't fix vision, maybe you can fix the work environment or the task that people are doing to be able to be more productive. Um, so I just want to give you an example of a few examples of tasks that we do in the lab. Um, so in this is called the Purdue task. It's a very well established task. Um, and what people are doing, what this lady is doing um, is the task involves basically putting pegs into holes. And um, the metrics that we come up with are things like how many, how many pegs was she able to put in the holes or how challenging it was it for her. And so she's wearing an assistive technology so we are um, able to track um, her performance with and without the assistive technology. Again, looking at the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the assistive technology. And um, we are on the right-hand side, 
let me just get this video going here. Um, on the right hand side, um, this is another perspective. We're looking at and tracking where she's looking. So that red dot that you see, um, you can see that she looks at, on a, at a location and then her hands go to it. This is another person, it's not the same subject, but again, same example, same. Um, the point is that we're able to track not only her hand movements, but also where she's looking. So the concept of eye-hand coordination um, becomes very, very important in these tasks. So you're coordinating your vision, where you're looking, and um, how you're moving your hands. Okay, another example that I want to show you. Um, this is a very stressful task. Um, we have a wheel that is turning and we can control the, the speed of it. And this person is has to put parts together. Um, so you can imagine the wheel can go very fast, very slow, and you have to put it together. And the parts and the output of this the performance that we're looking at is how many parts she was able to do. And we are also looking at hand movement. So this kind of task has relevance again um, in real life, in manufacturing jobs. So you can imagine assembly lines, maybe in an automobile this, uh, industry where um, there is a conveyor belt and things are moving fast and you need to put something and it moves. And so again, um, very ecologically valid, very real life with real translational implication kind of tasks. I get very frustrated with this task. So let's see. Um, I don't have videos here, but I have pictures. And again, just showing you other kind of tasks that we do again for to assess fine motor task. On the left hand side here, um, you have a size discrimination task where uh, you have nuts and bolts of different sizes that you have to match with the right uh, with the right size here. And then on this. One, um, it's a sorting task where you have a lot of chips and you have to sort them the right color. They're also numbered or have letters on them. And so again, um, so you can imagine with all these tasks that I just showed you, people come in with different vision impairments, different diagnosis, and we run them through all these tasks. And so we have a better idea of what they're able to do whether it's at home or at, or, at, or at work, what kind of tasks they really have trouble with. And we'll do all of these tasks in different lighting conditions. So one of the very simple human factors intervention is to increase either the light, um, the amplitude, the level of the lighting, or maybe change the color uh, from very warm to very cold or, or vice versa. So um, we look at lighting conditions, then we look at performance on all these different tasks. All right, I want to change gears on you. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, vision loss is a is a high, is a big risk factor for falls. Um, and so we look at balance assessment. That's the first thing we do: look at balance assessment. So. Uh, just to put everybody on the same on the same page, to maintain balance, we use three sensory channels. We use the vestibular sen uh, sense uh, channel inside the ear. We use um, vision and we use proprioception. Um, all of these channels get integrated in the brain. Um, we, we need some attention to be able to do the right integration. And then the brain outputs a command um, to maintain balance in sensory challenging conditions. So for example, um, this is also this process is also called multisensory information integration. Um, so what does that mean? So let's say people with loss of vision, um, they don't have vision, they're blind completely, right? So what the brain has to do is put more weight on the other two channels to be able to do this. And this is not trivial. Um, it's it takes some attention and cognitive resources to do this. Um, and so, what we do and the way we assess it, and I'm, this is the only uh, data plot that I'm going to show you, but it's a, it's a cool plot, so I couldn't resist. So this is, let me just turn off the volume here. Um, so in this kind of um, 
apparatus instrumentation. People are standing on a floor that can be moving. So we mess up their, their sensory, their somatosensory information, their proprioception. And then we can make the visual scene move. And um, what we look at is how well they're maintaining balance. So on the axis, um, on this plot here on the right-hand side, you can think of the y-axis being, being balanced performance with here being very, very poor balance, here good balance. And then this was done in glaucoma. So we have some data in glaucoma. And um, those are controlled on the zero side. And then the more negative here, the more um, visual field loss, loss they have in their better eye. So what this plot shows us is that if the floor is not moving, what you can see is that their vision loss doesn't really matter um, on balance. Balance is not impacted by their vest. The flat line, those are the open circles. And what this is telling me is that people with glaucoma are able um, to rely on somatosensory and other channels when they, they don't have, you know, they don't have vision. However, when you start moving the floor now, so their somatosensory is gone or is, is, is unreliable, and plus they don't have vision, people with low vision have a hard time um, relying maybe on their vestibular system. So again, it's it's what this kind of plot of data shows us is that we go and now talk to a physical therapy, who, a therapist who is an expert in balance therapy, and we tell them, here's what's happening, right? And so she can work, he or she can work with the patient to make their balance better, to train them to use other, other sensory channels to maintain balance. So again, very translational, very translational research. Um, and this is in collaboration with um, colleagues in, in Paris. It's kind of a state of the art uh, mobility assessment. We call it mobility standardized test or most in virtual reality. And there are two versions of this test. Um, there's a test that you see here in the, in the bottom left corner here, and that's a maze. It's a physical maze. And then they reproduce the, the colleagues in, in Paris, our colleagues in Paris, um, they reproduce that maze in virtual reality with, with goggles. And you can see maybe this person walking with a, with a goggle. And so um, it's a very well established now. It has been validated physical, I guess, um, the VR versions um, in people with glaucoma and other other population as well. And so it's really cool. Now we have the VR version, the street light, the Pittsburgh street lab. And we can, um, it's a very controlled task. Uh, we can vary the lighting, we can um, vary the difficulty. So people basically have to um, go through a maze and you can put all kinds of obstacles. Um, and multiple performance measures. So what we get out of that in terms of metric is how many errors, how much time they had to complete the trajectory, the maze, um, and then their feet um, tracking um, movements. So again, very, uh, very objective um, measurements. So again, my name is Clive D'Souza um, and I'm also part of uh, Street Lab. Uh, I have an engineering background, um, and the focus of my work really is an extension of what uh, Dr. Cham talked about, but specifically in the context of driving, right? And so one of the questions that might come up is, um, what's the connection between work that is happening at the Low Vision Institute, at the Vision Institute, and in the area of low vision rehabilitation and, and driving? Uh, driving is uh, a vital for people to access different resources in the community, whether it is healthcare, um, whether it is uh, employment, education, uh, as well as just um, social participation and, and recreation. Uh, it's also vital for our independence, right? There are other modes of transport, but driving is the most common mode in the United States. Um, and we all kind of know people or might even dread the day when we might be faced with the uh, the task of having to stop driving, right? Of having to hand over uh, our, our car keys uh, and having to rely on others for transportation. So 
um, we uh, kind of are focusing on driving as one of these critical outcomes that can really help people maintain independence uh, and quality of life. The challenge and the connection to low vision is that almost 90% of information that we get during the task of driving is visual, right? So this is about uh, the environment around us in terms of where you're driving, in terms of other vehicles on the road, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, other potential hazards, um, as well as information that is on our dashboard in terms of uh, monitoring your speed um, or knowing if you there is any or just changing the controls in terms of air conditioning and heating and, and entertainment systems, right? So if you aggregate all of that, almost 90% of information in driving is visual, right? And so any type of condition that impairs your vision, right, whether it is central vision, peripheral vision, right, is going to have an impact on your ability to drive and to drive safely. Just a couple of statistics, right? Again, low vision conditions could affect anyone at any age along the age spectrum. But just one, at least a couple of numbers that still strike me as very uh, impactful uh, and, um, and hopefully to some of you as well, is that 86% um, of Americans that are 65 and older continue to drive, right? And so what this is saying is that we continue to drive even in those latter years because it is so critical to maintaining independence and access, as I pointed out earlier. Um, and so people continue driving, even though they might have other age-related conditions that impact their vision, their mobility, their uh, cognition. Um, and they may not even sometimes know what implications that has for their own safety and for other drivers and people um, around them. The um, the NIH estimates that by the year 2050, 25% of all licensed drivers are expected to be 65 years and older. So one in four drivers is going to be an older adult, right? And that's because, again, of just the growing number of the people that we have in our aging population. Uh, people are living longer, uh, and they also want to be independent and mobile in their community, right? And so there is this um, overlap or intersection between uh, conditions affecting vision, aging in the population, as well as driving. So what does that mean for us at the UPMC Vision Institute? Right? So Dr. Sahel gave a wonderful introduction, reminding us of just the uh, different interventions that one can uh, take advantage of at the Vision Institute. Those could be different medical treatments, different therapy, different rehabilitation, and uh, Dr. Chan gave us a uh, good context about the different types of outcomes that one might be interested in, whether it is walking, uh, obstacle avoidance, uh, work performance. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, can I still drive, right? Or another way of framing that is, would I still be meeting the requirements, eligibility requirements of today's licensing laws to be safe on the road? Our current way of answering that question would be to be work would be involved working with a driver rehab specialist right so if you are not aware of this resource we have at upmc what's called as the adaptive driving program i'll give you a little bit more information about this but this essentially it's about working with a um, a, a clinician a therapist uh, where they will perform some assessments and give you some driving specific feedback and if you're ready, even take you on the road to assess your driving fitness. Okay. There are some limitations to that pathway, right? And so we at the at Street Lab um, are uh, now on our way to actually starting this new part of our research with driving, which I will also talk about in a few more slides. So let's let, look a little bit more about this UPMC adaptive driving program first. This is a photograph uh, of one of my, my former colleagues, uh, Amy Lane, and she is a certified driver rehab specialist. Um, she used to work at UPMC, but now has moved on. We've got a couple of new staff there, but this is showing you an example taken from one of the vehicles that we have. Uh, this is uh, Amy actually working with a, um, a, a patient of hers, and they're looking at using a spinner knob. So this is an attachment to a steering wheel because for example, the person's only able to use one hand 
um, or they maybe need to use one hand and the other hand for the brake and gas pedal using hand controls and unable to use their feet. So there are different kinds of physical adaptations that could be made to the vehicle, uh, but there could also be adaptations made to augment uh, vision deficits. So for example, things like uh, second or additional mirrors, larger mirrors, uh, or giving you some training on how to scan and how to be looking out for hazards that you might be missing. Uh, and so that's the kind of uh, approach that we, one would take in the context of adaptive driving and driver rehabilitation. Currently at UPMC, as part of the adaptive driving program, we have two, two driver rehab specialists. Um, and generally, they would conduct their evaluation in a two part, in two stages. One is a clinical assessment, where they would evaluate the patient for visual acuity, field of view, contrast sensitivity, uh, things like glare recovery, um, your, um, again, ability to see and detect objects maybe in low lighting conditions. Um, and then if one would pass that clinical assessment, only then would they be considered eligible and safe enough to be taken on the road for what's called as an on-road assessment. We have two vehicles as part of this program. One is a, a Volvo a sedan, and the second, a newer vehicle, is a Hyundai SUV. Um, and between these two vehicles, pre presuming one of them is a good fit, um, and they're also wheelchair accessible, so now one can um, be deemed safe enough to be taken on the road, uh, and then an assessment would occur. There are a couple of challenges with this current pathway. One is that it is very resource intensive. Our clinicians um, have only limited capacity to take patients and schedule patients for these clinical and on-road assessments. This can take a lot of time uh, and they also um, can cost some money, right? Um, and so there are some severe bottlenecks in that process that might limit people from fully utilizing this service. There is another concern about on road, about safety of the passenger, safety of our clinicians as well, and other pedestrians on the road, right? And so, if somebody is even, uh, if our clinicians deem somebody as unsafe, they will not even take you into the car, right? So they might um, kind of just uh, terminate their uh, therapy sessions right at the clinical assessment, right? And so, very few, if eligible patients of theirs might actually end up making it to the on-road assessment. And if you don't meet some of the requirements there, it might even lead to severe driving restrictions or even what we call as driving cessation, where you might not, you might have to uh, give up your driving license. So as a path between those two options, between what our clinicians experience at the Low Vision Institute and getting behind the wheel on an on-road evaluation, a driving simulator, that's what we, um, we have now at the Vision Institute, allows us to still help patients assess and evaluate their driving skills in a safe environment without necessarily um, being put in that unsafe condition of being in an actual car on the road. Right? And so the simulator allows us to look at performance, driving performance in a variety of different conditions, and also help patients uh, develop better strategies right, on how to drive safely, um, which I will talk about shortly. So what I'm showing here on this slide is a photograph of our recently acquired driving simulator. And it has got these three large screens. It's got, it's got a driving console. So it's actually constructed from um, actual vehicle components. So it has the look and feel of an actual driver um, station. We have a steering wheel. We have a driver's seat. Uh, but this whole platform, in a sense, vibrates and moves to road conditions. So if you're driving on a smooth road versus on a gravel path, uh, it will kind of uh, vibrate and move differently versus if you're accelerating or slowing down and braking or taking a turn, there'll be a little bit of a tilt and movement to this platform. So kind of captures that physical movement of as if you're in a real car. This um, setup is unique in the sense that we can also take out the driver's seat. It's on wheels, so we can take that out. And that way, even somebody with a wheelchair can still kind of, uh, move into the driver 
position and still drive this vehicle. Our simulator also has hand controls. So if someone's unable to use their feet, they can drive entirely just using their hands, right? So we have a, a, um, a lever for braking and acceleration, as well as for um, uh, operating the steering wheel, typically with a, with a spinner knob. Um, we also have the um, a full 180 degree field of view, as well as the ability to change different driving scenarios. So uh, this image right now is showing just a, a driving scenario uh, in a downtown or more urban setting. On this next slide, I'm showing another image. Uh, this is uh, the person driving here actually is our driving rehab specialist at the UPMC Adaptive Driving Program, Melissa Alexak. So if any of you on, the, uh, on this webinar are interested in reaching out to her, uh, definitely let us know and we can put you in touch. Uh, but this is actually, so as part of our driving research, we're actually working closely with Melissa. This is her uh, driving on a more, uh, on a highway um, uh, scenario, right? So there's in this case, less traffic. Um, and just a couple of points that I want to make here about the kinds of things that we are interested from a um, research perspective that we can also measure uh, and also give feedback to our research participants, as well as patients that would end up using this facility. So one is we're interested in driving performance, right? And that is just in terms of how the driver is operating the vehicle, are they doing so in a proper and, and, and uh, safe manner, right? So there is the, um, the performance of the vehicle, um, how fast it is going, how close you might be getting to other vehicles, are you staying in the center of the lane? Um, are you uh, maintaining the speed limit, right? And just so in terms of driving performance. Our second, another level to this, is getting a better understanding of what is the driver doing in order to be performing that task of driving, right? So are they scanning the rear view mirrors correctly? Are they checking their speedometer to make sure that they're, that they're uh, monitoring their speed? Are they looking at and making sure that they're aware of other vehicles around them or pedestrians if somebody's crossing the street, right? And so what kind of behaviors are the, is the driver, in this case, um, uh, showing in order to make sure that they're driving properly? Like I mentioned at the start of my presentation, 90% of that information is visual, of course. What are some other modes of information that we might be acquiring? Well, one is uh, audio. So this, this system has got a, a 3D surround sound system. So it's actually um, giving you sounds from different locations uh, about things like the, uh, the engine of the car or, or other cars around you or other cars honking at you. So all of that uh, we can capture, um, as well as uh, the tactile or vibratory information. Right, So the movement of that platform is also giving you a sense of speed, of acceleration, deceleration. So we're also getting that haptic feedback, right? But 90% is visual. And so what we are also interested in seeing is where is the driver looking? Right? I'll show you another slide later uh, where we are able to monitor the gaze of the driver to make sure that they are to see where they're looking, how much of time they've spent looking at the road in front of them, versus looking at the uh, rear view mirror, uh, versus looking at the dashboard maybe to look at their speedometer. So they look and are they scanning the environment to make sure that they're keeping an eye out for other cars, other, other pedestrians, other bicyclists. Um, and so we are interested in being able to track those gaze behaviors. And if you're seeing certain kinds of gaze patterns or behaviors that are unsafe, based on one's uh, vision deficit, we can then also give them strategies on how they can actually do those tasks better. So here's another image of our driving simulator view. This is the view taken from what a driver would typically be seeing if they were looking directly in front of them. In this scenario, I'm showing you another highway scenery, but with a lot more traffic on the road, right? So there probably is some kind of a um, an accident or some kind of an event happening up ahead where the traffic is backed up, right? And so one of the challenges in um, a situation like this is you could have cars that in front of you suddenly braking or slowing down, 
So making sure that you keep a safe enough distance or headway between you and the car in front of you. You might have some impatient drivers that will try to change lanes and try to speed up. Uh, and so are you also making sure you're, you're gazing, you're kind of scanning around you uh, and making sure that there are no cars trying to cut in front of you. Uh, and so those are the kinds of situations that we can put people into safely in our driving simulator. Unlike a behind the wheel on road assessment, right? Over here in our simulator, yes, you could safely get into an accident. You could safely bump another car without there being a lot of severe consequences, right? And so um, the simulator allows us to put people in these somewhat unsafe conditions to understand how they're gonna respond and to make sure that they're gonna be safe when they do end up driving on the road. One of the big questions when talking about driving um, is what's gonna be the uh, effect of driving automation? Um, and we hear a lot about driverless cars. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, technologies in the car like um, um, forward collision warning, blind spot warning systems, adaptive cruise control. Um, and so to a limited extent, we are also able to simulate some of those technologies in our car, right? So in this slide, I'm actually showing you a view that the driver would be seeing, but we are augmenting that view with additional safety information. And in this case, showing you the, um, the path in front of you, if it is cleared or not, and how much time or distance, depending on your speed, you would need to come to a full stop. Right? So if that traffic light were to change from green to yellow and then to, to red, or if a pedestrian suddenly tries to um, jaywalk and cross across the street, at your current speed, how much distance would you need to come to a full stop? Right, And so we're kind of augmenting or adding additional information that otherwise a person may not have to help them in this task of driving. So in the simulator, we can now also start understanding the effects of these new technologies along with a vision impairment or deficit someone might have to understand what is the benefit in terms of their driving performance and safety. Right? Lastly, I wanna show you just a couple of slides. This is a demonstration we were doing with a technology vendor and we're still looking to add this technology to our driving simulator where we can over time, map out precisely where the driver was looking at during the entire, uh, this entire drive that they have taken, right? And so those, if you look at the image on the top, it is showing you um, all of the, um, the, the dwells or the, fix, or the eye fixations that the driver had um, as they were driving. And clearly you can see here, right? They were doing a good job. They were spending most of the time looking in front of them. That's also shown in this heat map below, in the image below. So they spent a lot of their time looking at the road directly in front of them. That's a good thing. They will also spend a little bit of time looking at the mirrors, looking at the rear mirror above them, looking at the left mirror, right? And so they were looking to make sure that in the other lane, the left lane, there was no cars kind of maybe approaching them from the back and trying to overtake them. So that was good. Uh, and they were also scanning the road to the side of them to make sure that there were no hazards or threats, right? So this is the kind of feedback we can get from our simulator to understand if somebody's actually using the correct and safe uh, visual gaze patterns, if they're making sure they're spending enough time looking at the rear view mirror, looking at the speedometer uh, below, looking at the road in front of them. Um, and actually, if they're not having these safe behaviors, then being able to give them feedback uh, and the training so they can develop more safe driving habits. So that's just a quick snapshot of the type of research and the type of um, uh, research questions, as well as type of um, interventions we can provide in the context of driving to support people and patients at UPMC with this important task. That's all I have, and I will turn it back to, to Carrie. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chom and Dr. D'Souza for that really interesting 
um, topic, we don't get to talk a lot about, we talk about research, uh, basic science clinical research a lot, but it's really nice to see some of the more um, translational studies that you're working on too, that you're involving human subjects in. Um, so one of the questions or a couple of the questions that we have are related to um, are related to the people that you're working with. So are you targeting a certain age group when you're composing these, you know, these trials and these simulations with the driving simulator? Um, and then also you did mention how some people could um, contact your your groups to to enroll if they uh, if they uh, if they match. But do you focus on an age group and what are you looking for when you choose subjects for these trials? So it really depends on what the research question is, right? If we're looking at age-related vision problems, then we look at older older adults. But if we're looking at a diagnosis and um, it affects a, a spectrum of age, then we look at all the spectrum. Um, so it really depends on what the age spectrum. And then for the work-related stuff that we do, for the work-related research is working uh, population. So again, it, people who are able to work. So the studies are advertised. Um, we would love, it's, the recruitment is always a challenge. So we would love to have more participations. Um, so yeah. Clive? Yes, and so my answer is uh, very similar to, to Rakesh. I think she covered it very well. Um, the, it really it depends on the research question. Uh, but some of our studies are can be broad in terms of an age spectrum, but some can be very specific. Uh, and I'll just uh, maybe give you another couple of examples of the kinds of things we might be looking at down the road, right? So one is we're interested in low vision and, and vision impairment in the context of driving. But when you start then adding aspects of cognition, right? So whether it is uh, any age-related dementias, for example, right? And how that might help with, uh, or contribute to safe driving, uh, navigation, uh, uh, being able to read and understand where you are in, in kind of in, in space, in the world, uh, in terms of driving and, and understanding the road uh, directions, right? So there's a cognitive part to this as well. Um, and so then we might be looking at also some older drivers. Uh, we've been getting some queries from our um, a driving rehab specialist. She's been seeing a lot of patients that uh, are younger, 16, 17, 18 year olds that might have um, autism, right? And they're curious and their family parents are curious if, uh, if they'd be able to be, ever be able to drive independently, right? And so there might be some other age groups, for example, younger, that we might also be considering down the road uh, in terms of the driving simulator research. So one is, I think it goes beyond just low vision and it might also involve like other conditions like cognition, um, physical impairments, right? So people that might working with our colleagues in the rehab institute, looking at patients that might have lower leg amputations and that use a prosthesis, right? So, um, so we've been getting queries from all over. But at least for now, right? Some of our most of our um, populations are, are quite broad, mm -hmm. and and what we're looking for are people who really participate because these can be very time intensive studies. Okay, thank you. Do uh, do you either or both of you work with um, different agencies um, in the realm of your research to um, evaluate? Uh, employment opportunities and and fitness for work um, and the agencies some of them off you know BBS OVR um, employment agencies do you work with other organizations in, in your in your research to to figure out the abilities of of their constituents? No, I, I I can maybe take an attempt at that, Rake, if you're fine with that. Um, so yes, um, I think one. Thing I would like to just remind everyone is that a lot of our driving research is just getting started. So we've only acquired the simulator like last year, uh, but we have reached out, at least I have reached out to different organizations. I know I've had a couple of meetings with, with, with the uh, Blind and Vision Rehab Services of Pittsburgh um, and, and talking about how we might collaborate with them. 
um, as well as, like I said, the UPMC adaptive driving program. Um, the challenge always comes up about reimbursements and, and, and financial kind of uh, uh, support. Um, and so some of that, it's an ongoing conversation, but yes, we are definitely interested in working with, with community partners, um, both in terms of making sure that people in the community are aware of the type of resources we have at the UPMC Vision Institute, um, as well as making sure that we can um, people can avail of these services in terms of um, preparing themselves for employment, uh, or for a driving license, or whether it is even just um, being um, or aging kind of successfully and healthily in their in their homes. I'll I'll just add that um, I am I'm also visited the BVRS several times. I'm very impressed with um, the road signs that their patients are building. Um, so again, I think employment is very important for them. Um, but we're also funded, for me at least, I'm funded by NIOSH, which is a federal agency interested in um, improving um, the work conditions and work participations in people with low vision. So we're working on it. I think we have time for two more questions. So uh, this question might be answerable by you both, or it might be answerable by Dr. Sahel. I think he's still uh, on the panel here. Um, and it's related to visual rehabilitation. So this, uh, this individual says, when I think of rehabilitation, I think of efforts to help make a particular problem better. Um, I understand that with many eye conditions, there are no cures. However, are there any, um, are there any activities, supplements, exercises, um, or, or, or drugs that could um, improve your vision, even though the condition you're experiencing technically doesn't have a cure. Dr. Sahel, do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very broad question. Uh, I think uh, there's no real drug, uh, except if you have a treatment for the eye condition or vision condition. In that case, this is uh, not really the field of rehabilitation. Although, as we discussed, there is a synergy between the therapy and the rehabilitation process. Uh, I think one of the key elements is the motivation and the will to go through all the rehabilitation process because this is not a magical process. It doesn't occur over a few minutes. It really requires a lot of training, failing, repeating until you succeed eventually. It's really exploring a new territory. And uh, it has to, it's a partnership between the uh, rehabilitation people. We had a couple of seminars with Will Smith, Holly Stant, and our team, which is working on low vision. And we are working daily with uh, Clive and Rakia because there is a part which is helping people in daily activities. And there is a part which is exploring new ways for making, assessing and uh, supporting them. But the patient is uh, really the main main actor. They are still the ones who are really making the decision and they have to be highly motivated. So I think one of the reasons things can fail is when people don't have the wherewithal or really the will to continue. And it's not for, I'm not blaming on anyone. I just say it's difficult. You have to know that and you have to admit that you have to go through a process. Thank you. Um, I have, there's one other question that was asked, um, and I'm going to try to apply it to both Dr. Chom and Dr. D'Souza before we uh, have to conclude this afternoon. So um, this person asked if any professional driving industries are interested in getting their drivers evaluated with um, a simulator. And then I'd also like to extend that to Dr. Chom. Do you work with um, companies of products or you said you work with um, slips, trips, and falls, do you work with other devices or shoes? Or do you work with other, you know, organizations and companies that are interested in having their products or their drivers evaluated? So the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. We work actually with um, drug companies that are developing new drugs for low vision, and we evaluate the impact of their treatment on mobility. Um, and navigation through a maze, for example. So we've done those, those are the clinical trials. Uh, but if we extend beyond vision, um, we have colleagues as well in my lab that um, look at the impact of shoes um, and the impact of a flooring environment. Um, and so, yes, we, we do 
work with companies very closely. Um, so we get funding from both companies and federal agencies. Thank you. My response is short, not at the moment, but we would be very interested in working if, if there are companies that employ a lot of people that have uh, that involve that involves driving as a big component. I think just given the resources we have between us at the Vision Institute and the Adaptive Driving Program, we'd be happy to work with companies and support their employees. Um, so if anyone on the call or the person that has posted the question has suggestions for us or connections that they would recommend, please let us know uh, and we'd be glad to follow up. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to uh, educate us today about the really neat work that you're doing. Um, I know there are a few questions we didn't have the chance to answer live. We will make sure that those questions are asked to our speakers and we will get the answers to you via email following today's program. Um, thank you, Dr. D'Souza, Dr. Sahel, Dr. Cham. Really great program today. We look forward to hearing more about this you know, in future webinars. So thank you again and everybody enjoy your, your uh, afternoon.